We have seen in the previous video how we can model a multi-period inventory model. Now here it is very similar. The only difference is that instead of inventory, we are going to talk about a work scheduling problem here. So let's start. The multi-period cases always involve something that changes over time. Here we are going to see where a decision maker needs to schedule worker when the demand is not static. In other words, the demand for workers changes over time. So let's see the next example. In this example, CSL is a chain of stores that service computers. Each month, um, it requires a number of hours of skilled repair time from the technicians. But the number of hours are different from month to month. For example, in January, CSL needs 6,000 hours of skilled repair time from the technicians. And then if you keep reading, you see that um, at the beginning, it has 50 skilled technicians and each skilled technician can work up to 160 hours. As usual, if you see the word up to, it means that this is a constraint. And then um, not only uh, the skilled technicians that um, CSL currently has, CSL can also hire new technicians. But then when you have a new technician, you must train them for months to become a skilled technician. Okay, and then, um, so this is about the training of the new technician. It requires supervision by the experienced ones. And then this is about the salary for um, the technician. And then um, this is the salary for the trainee or the new technicians that are still in the training session. And then here, 5% of the experienced technicians quit at the end of each month to join our competitor, which is Plum Computers. Uh, what this problem wants us to do is to minimize the labor cost, but still meeting this uh, required number of service for the next five months. I will give you the pause in the video to give you the chance to really read this problem carefully. Okay, so let's start by looking at the objective function. It says that the objective is to minimize the labor cost. So if we look at the information, we see that the labor cost comes from um, paying the experienced technician $2,000 a month and then paying the trainee $1,000 a month. So those are the costs that we can see in the problem. It means that we can say what we want to minimize here is the cost from the experienced technician every month, $2,000, and then for each trainee each month, $1,000. Now let's define what X1 and Y1 are, and also the other axis and Ys. So XT is the number of technicians trained during month T, right? That's why they are paid $1,000 because they are still in the training session in the month T. So X1 is the number of technicians trained during month one and so on. What about the Ys? Y1 is the number of experienced technicians at the beginning of month one. So Y describes the number of experienced technicians that you already have at the beginning of one month. So suppose you, rec um, you hire somebody to join the training at month one, this person will become an experienced technician in month two. If you hire somebody to join the training at month three, he or she will become an experienced technician at month four. So in the first month uh, in the CSL, he or she will be paid 1000 because still in the training session. 
in the second month in CSL, he or she will be paid 2000 because he or she has finished the training and has become an experienced technician. Let's start defining the constraints. It says here that CSL requires um, skilled repair time each of the following next five months, and we must meet these uh, requirements. For example, in the first month, we need to have the skilled repair time at least 6,000. So here in the right hand side, you see that you need to have greater than or equal to 6,000 hours. Because um, here it says 6,000, so there you say the number of hours of skilled repair time must be greater than or equal to 6,000. So how many hours do we have actually? Well, you have Y1 number of experienced technicians and each of these experienced technicians can work 160 hours. So Y1 number of people and every single person can work 160 hours. So in total, you have 160 times Y1. However, remember that for each trainee that you have in the month, you have to train them for 50 hours in a month. And then this cuts away the hours that the experienced technicians can do the repair because they need to train the new uh, employees or the trainees. So how many trainees that we have in month one? We have X1 trainees. And then for each of this trainee, we need to spend 50 hours for them. So from the total 160 times Y1, we need to cut away 50 times X1 because we need to spend 50 hours for each trainee that we have. And then after cutting away the hours that we need to spend for the trainees, the hours that we have to repair all the computers must still greater than or equals to 6,000. So that's the explanation for this constraint. And then we do the very similar thing for all the other months. In the previous slide, we have talked about how we need to have enough hours from the skilled technicians for each month. But we haven't talked about the fact that if we have a trainee in this month, those trainees will become an experienced technicians in the next month. We also haven't talked about the fact that if we have experienced technicians, um, this many people in this month, 5% of them will be leaving at the end of this month. So in other words, we have X1 and Y1 for the first month. We need to talk about what is the relation between those numbers and X2, Y2. So the trainee will become experienced technician in the second month, but then the experienced technician from the first month, 5% of them will quit. And the same thing happened from the second month to the third month. So looking at the first and the second month, we can say that the number of experienced technicians at month two equals to, num to the number of experienced technicians in first month plus the trainee from the first month minus 5% of Y1 who is leaving. We can also say this is equal both of these equations. You can use any of them. You can say that only 95% of Y1 will join uh, Y2 plus X1. So in other words, the number of experienced technicians in the second month equals to 90% of the experienced technicians at month one, plus the trainees that we have at month one. So that's how we define the relation between one month to the next one. As usual, put the sign restrictions to complete the formulation that all the variables here must be non-negative for all months. So for t, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, x, t, y, t must be greater than or equals to 0. To summarize what we've seen in the first three weeks of this Operations Research 1 course, 
First, that you need to remember that a formulation of linear programming problem must consist of the definition of decision variables, the definition of the objective function, a set of constraints, and the sign restrictions. So these four things you must not forget in your linear programming formulation. And then I also like to remind you that when you define the decision variables, they need to be correct and as specific as possible. And then when you have the constraints and the objective function, and then you try to see whether those equations are logical or not, one thing you may check is to check the units. Okay, If all the terms have the same units, if the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the inequalities have the same units, then at least logically it might be correct. I'm not saying that it will be 100% correct, but at least from uh, in the terms of units, they are already okay. So you can check again whether you formulate the constraints or the objective function correctly. So that's the end of the topic of the formulation of linear programming problem. You've learned a lot, and now let's go on to the fourth week where we are going to solve these um, linear programming models, which means that we are going to get the optimal solution for each model that we formulated. So see you in the fourth week. Thank you.